Sorry about that, I thought I was unmuted, but anyway. Welcome to our web conference of the new year and welcome to 2021. So 2020, one word, oof. So last year we started off with um, almost getting to World War III with the war in with Iran. Thankfully that was averted. But of course another crisis has occurred which of course is the COVID-19 pandemic. And it gave, uh, and we also had to go into lockdown in most states at least. <clears throat> but, um, but, as, um, but that is because, um, you know, we want to stay safe and make sure none of us, you know, get uh, this conta deadly, conta well, not contagious disease, excuse me. And, um, <clears throat> And a lot of uh, things, and um, but a lot of um, things have happened last year, such as the uh, Black Lives Matter uprisings, and this has also um, showed us that um, that there are major flaws within our capitalist system, as um, well as our a law enforcement. And it and it is clear that we need a whole new set of economic um, system and a new and a new set of law enforcement. And of course, that is why we are here in 2021 looking forward for a new year and a new, sorry about that, <laughs> a, new, um, a new form of politics, which will be very much radical. And of course, um, 2021, well, there's some good news and there's bad news. Good news is Donald Trump is gone bad news is Joe Biden's our president. But Mitch McConnell, no longer the, the Senate Majority Leader. However, Chuck Schumer is our new Senate Majority Leader. Yay. But this just shows us that we can no longer rely, if we haven't already, on federal elective politics. And speaking, and um, and now that uh, we have a couple of few uh, Reddit, um, it's, excuse me, my throat. So a few, uh, a few of, um, 
a few amateur uh, stock investors from Reddit have uh, invested in stock in GameStop, and this has caused a bubble. Unfortunately, though, the elites of Wall Street do not like this. And it also shows that, um, that because the elites have shown that only the Wall Street can control the market, it also shows cracks in Wall Street. And right now, I would like to uh, give it away to uh, uh, Lily of uh, Sina with an uh, uh, activist. Take it away, Lily. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union nearly 30 years ago, many on the left have disregarded the project of Marxist-Leninist socialism as a whole. They deride it as state capitalist or totalitarian. But we here at CPI view the aftermath of the USSR as an example of why all workers and progressive-minded people should support anti-imperialist or Marxist-Leninist countries, even if they themselves do not consider themselves to be Marxist-Leninists. <clears throat> Many people who call themselves leftists cheered for Yeltsin bringing democracy because they would no longer have to defend the Soviet Union. However, the collapse of the USSR was not only an economic disaster for the former Soviet republics, but also the capitalist social democracies of the West. Since 1989, with the dismantling of socialism in the East, we have seen the dismantling of social welfare in the West. Neoliberalism, the ideology of privatization and unrestricted free market greed has dominated the world since the collapse of the Eastern Bloc. And the social democratic and liberal parties have gone along with it. In our view, the Soviet Union during the Cold War functioned as a counterweight, holding back some of the most brutal excesses of Western capitalism, a bargaining chip for the workers of the world, essentially. As long as people knew there was an alternative to capitalism with a strong guaranteed social wage, the capitalist powers of the world needed to convince their working class to believe their system of profits was better and to persuade them they conceded some things. These concessions were greater in Western Europe where socialist people's democracies were right at their doorstep. Even though many of these concessions were fought for by socialists and communists, unemployment insurance, and the 40-hour work week, for example. But nonetheless, the bourgeoisie of the capitalist countries came to accept these concessions as a necessary bulwark against Soviet communism. With the end of the Cold War, however, these countries no longer needed these concessions, and they demolished them rather brutally. Privatization and austerity have largely ruled the world in the past quarter century, but there's an emerging alternative. The One Belt, One Road initiative coming from China and their model of loaning, contrary to the IMF's model. China does not require public sector cuts in austerity and austerity. But I'm not here to discuss China and the Belt and Road, although there's plenty to be said. I'm here to explain to all people fighting for a better life and a better world that when the imperialists beat down an independent country in the developing world, all of us suffer. We must oppose all imperialist attacks on Iran, Venezuela, China, and other anti-imperialist countries, regardless of whatever criticisms we might have with their political and economic systems. An attack on one is an attack on all. Solidarity. Thank you, Lily, for that, inv and, uh, that inspiring uh, report. Next up is uh, Max de Sachs, also from Sina. Take it away, Max de Sachs. Hey everyone, um, my name is Max de Sachs. That's how you refer to me in this in this uh, community. Um, I play alto saxophone, and I'm from the Beltway region of Washington D.C. Now, I've been a communist for a long time. Well, in more specifics, since I was 13, I picked up Marx, I picked up Lenin. And uh, during those form formative years, like as I discovered new information about socialism and about communism, I, I swapped ideologies left and right in terms of the left wing like sphere of ideologies. Uh, this really only changed when I realized, when I did realize eventually that Marxism and Marxist Lenin and everything we have been told in the West and just in, and particularly in the United States of America, my home country, about Marxism-Leninism is not true. 
It is either a distortion, it is either propaganda, or it is either simply lying by omission and not taking into account historical context. Now, once I realized this, I came to the conclusion and after seeing like almost every force throughout history that has successfully managed to build like at least a form of socialism in their country was Marxist-Leninist, after seeing this, I realized that I needed to apply Marxian analysis to where I came from. I am from the intelligentsia, I'll be straight up. And I realized that a lot of my class in terms of the intelligentsia has been turned against socialism. It has been turned either toward you know, standard bourgeois liberalism or even far right politics in some cases. Now, considering these, so these sobering facts, I realize myself as a Marxist Leninist and as a member of the intelligentsia, I do have a lot of time on my hands. I have time to, as, as a lot of people in my generation do, I have time to play video games, I have time to, you know, do non-constructive stuff, I have time to hang out, waste time with friends, and do all sorts of things. But I realized as a Marxist, this time needs to be applied. And if I was to be serious about Marxism and Marxist-Leninist and being a principled Marxist-Leninist, I needed to apply this time toward building an actual movement among the masses for the masses, not just simply going to protest, not just simply being on Twitter, not just simply talking on Discord. And to this effect, I discovered Students and Youth for a New America. Students and Youth for a New America is an independent socialist youth group. We do not claim to be part of any party, although we work with several parties and associate organizations. And we are non-sectarian. We don't seek Twitter battles. We don't seek just very infantile disputes over minutia of policy and opinion that we see all across even like some of our other comrades and their organizations. We seek unity in the face of opposition. And to this regard, we are willing to work with organizations that are in touch with the masses in their local area. Uh, now, to get in touch with the masses in my local area, I realized that I needed to go into DC. I needed to go into regions that I've never been in before. I needed to visit neighborhoods and places that I passed by going either to the National Mall or toward like the heart of DC itself. And to this effect, um, I started Sign Up Beltway, which is a branch of Students in Youth for New America. Now, we're still a tiny branch. We are still, but we are independent of parties. And we are also dedicated toward building, a, getting out of the movement, getting out of the liberal cliches, getting out of the cliques, getting out of the nonsense, and going directly to the masses and providing aid and support. Now, a couple actions that Sign Up Beltway has taken, even though we are a small group, um, we help distribute mutual aid, including food, water, and uh, winter clothing, medicine, and militaries to encampments of people who are in D.C. who are in poverty. Um, there's, an, there's an encampment um, by, uh, like, right in the heart of D.C. itself, like, not that far from Howard University um, that is in a public park. And you can find, like, 20 tents of people who are homeless in this encampment. And then right across the street, there's empty housing, empty apartments with no one in them. Why does this exist? Well, it exists partially for the parasitic landlords and the parasitic people who own these houses who don't want to fill them. They don't want to fill them for, for people who, want, who need houses. They seek profit. They seek money. They do not seek to provide for the people. Now, to this effect, Sign Up Beltway has also realized that um, since, the, since a lot of people in, like, my, in my like, region and in my neighborhood where I live personally are very upper middle class and very intelligentsia, we've realized that even though this is the case, we can still use the intelligentsia to a degree. So Sign has set up donation drives for clothes. We've set up donation drives for toiletries. We've set up donation drives to actually get, take resources that are not needed, to be frank, amongst like a lot of members of the intelligentsia and direct them toward neighborhoods, direct them toward communities that do need these resources. And in doing this, we are using, and we are basically providing for the people. We are providing a source where the government has completely abandoned its people. 
And I think this is a really important concept that a lot of Marxists and a lot of leftists have to understand. We have to get out of this protest milieu. We have to get out of the movement and to the masses. We have to look at poverty directly in the eye, directly in our neighborhoods, directly in our cities, directly in our, all of our towns. And we have to change that. We have to help people. It's the only way we're going to build our movement. And it's the only way socialism will come to America by helping people. It's not about supporting a particular country. It's not about, it's not about a particular policy or a particular population. It's about bringing this ideology, this ideology of uplifting humanity as a whole, uplifting people's economic status, uplifting democracy, uplifting like the and uplifting like just our country from what capitalism has done to our people. This is the essence of socialism. And if we're to bring it to America as Marxists, we need to dedicate ourselves toward that movement. Now, to all the people who are watching this at home, I want you to think of one simple thing. If you're serious, if you're willing to dedicate a lots of time, and I mean lots of time, maybe even like as like for, for toward this movement toward socialism, if you're willing to dedicate oh, even your life toward this movement, then we need everyone we can get. And it's something that everyone has to think about on, you know, on a, on a certain level. What can I do today to advance the cause of proletarian internationalism? What can I do today to prevent a Middle Eastern country from getting bombed or robbed? What can I do today to help my neighborhood? Not tomorrow, today. And I'm 17, I'm young. I could be doing other things. I could be hanging out more with friends. I could be focusing more on school, trying to get into some bourgeois college that's gonna teach me liberal abstractions to try and confuse me. I could be focused on a lot of other things, but this is what I'm doing. This is what Marxists need to do. This is what people free time need to do who consider themselves Marxists. Right on, Max to Sachs. Give it up for Max. And Lily, and, and please give it up for Lily as well. Thank you so much. Again, 2021 is to me the year of hope because we are, we have so much, you know, to, to build on and we have so much to progress on. And, <clears throat> And I am really honored, you know, to be here all with you. And I'm also honored to be introducing our next guest, who is a um, world-renowned folk singer and songwriter. Um, please uh, t give it up for David uh, uh, Rovix. Well, it is a pleasure to be joining you guys here. And I love those speeches. And um, I would add that... Uh, <clears throat> that uh, there's um from my experience to build a m movement we need to uh be part of activities that are happening locally and uh uh that that are speaking to where people are at and i think um that that is going to be for a lot of people in a lot of this country that is uh, going to have to do with the waves of evictions coming and if anybody's mic is on for optimal audio, you can mute it. If you're not me, mute your mic. I can hear somebody's mic is on um, because I'm a musician, so I can hear these things. Secret powers. Um, well, well done. And um, I'm going to take the headphone off because I don't need it in. If everybody's muted anyway. But uh, this is a song... Um, that sort of represents exactly those kinds of absentee landlords that the, I'm sorry, the last speaker was just speaking about. Uh, this is uh, one in particular. To all the Jared Kushners of the world and all the money that you own, you who look at us with such indifference, sitting upon your throne, 
from which you collect all the rent from your subjects in all the most gentrified towns. Regardless of whether a global pandemic forced us to shut everything down. To all the Jared Kushners of the world, for whom the ceiling is the sky. For you, life comes so easy, inherited from birth. Why would you ever ask why? Do you think you earned it all? It's up to you how much you charge. It's all yours to keep. Would you climb any mountain of corpses, no matter how slippery, no matter how steep? To all the Jared Kushners of the world, is your appetite ever met? At what point do you ever wonder just how fucked you can make things get? Before it's bad enough that even you and your investors can see the whole thing's gonna fall. Just how top heavy can an icon be before it can't stand up at all? To all the Jared Kushners of the world, how do you expect things will transpire? When all your filings are enforced and the moratorium expires, do you envision a neat row of U-Haul trucks, tenants all packed up to leave? Their homes, your businesses, their neighborhoods, their cemeteries, where they used to go to grieve. To all the Jared Kushners of the world, and all your ill-begotten gains. You who sit comfortably in your limousine, ignoring all the bloodstains. Have you seen this movie before? Was it good? What's your favorite scene? Mine's when they take off the blindfold and the king meets his guillotine. To all the Jared Kushners of the world. And um, I think I think I, I had a request for one of the songs, so I'll do and I'll do three songs. I'm doing a 15 minute set here. So this. Um, This next song is about somebody that everybody has heard of, uh, who needs no introduction. But if you don't know what WikiLeaks uh, is, you know, you can look it up. Behind these prison walls, there's a man who's won awards. For the work that he has done And all that it affords Such as the knowledge of the harbors Committed in our name They can't stop the message So the messenger gets blamed Behind these prison walls in solitary confinement In a land of rolling hills and royalty And other such refinement Is someone who is a hero To whistleblowers everywhere Who helped them tell the world Of the crimes of Tony Blair Behind these prison walls You will find a mortal man The reason why we know what happened In Afghanistan When the soldiers of the empire Whose sunset long before Were torturing civilians in their terror war behind these prison walls is a part of WikiLeaks an eloquent orator but you won't hear him speak locked away in silence 
one who knows too well how those in power act when there's another war to sell. Behind these prison walls is one who stands accused of exactly what offenses the U.S. has refused to say precisely which or to try to clear the mist or to explain how he's not the same as the other journalists behind these prison walls is a person they deprive of most of the things in life that keep us all alive. A person being tortured as we stand here now for revealing the war crimes. Why, when, where, how? Behind these prison walls Our very right to be informed Of what the hell is going on Is the teacup in this storm With knowledge there is power So the solution by the crown A 24 hour a day indefinite lockdown behind these prison walls and uh, then somebody suggested this song which I'll close with and if anybody's in Portland then please uh, go to Artists for Rent Control and sign up to become part of Portland Emergency Eviction Response and uh Everybody's welcome. Locksmiths, especially. We need locksmiths. If anybody knows any locksmiths in Portland. Because when we ev unevict people, I mean, this uh, hasn't yet been a situation exactly, but when we unevict people, we, we may need to actually, you know, break into the houses that they've been evicted from, which, you know, ideally with a locksmith rather than like a crowbar. You know? When you work in two jobs and living in a tent When a house costs a million bucks and you can't pay the rent When politicians say they'll help but it keeps getting worse Each time the landlord lobby pulls the strings of the purse When the human right to housing isn't even part of the debate You know you're living in a failed state When millions of citizens are spending half their lives Locked up in a prison for trying to survive When laws must be broken just to have a place to stay When the prisons pay the senators to look the other way If you have to be a criminal to put food upon your plate You know you're living in a failed state When you're facing climate breakdown, when the trees are all on fire, when half the country's underwater, when a climate change denier runs the nation, and the opposition party votes for oil rigs and pipelines, it's not so much a country as it is a corporation. Buckling under its weight, you know you're living in a failed state. When your nation is an empire facing daily blowback And the only thing your leaders can think to do is attack Bipartisan consensus that we need to spend 700 billion before the year's end On a military budget to make America great You know you're living in a failed state When 
And almost every day, some psycho with a gun has to open fire on a crowd before it's done. When a music festival becomes a free fire zone, and all they can say is it's okay now he was acting alone. Buy some armor, pray to God, and hide behind a gate. You know, you're living in a failed state. You know, you're living in a failed state. You know, you're living in a failed state. And that is my contribution. Thank you very much for listening, everybody out there. All right, give it up for David Rovix. Woo! Thank you. Now that is true folk music. And not that uh, hipster bullshit you hear in Brooklyn or um, like, uh, <laughs> uh, where am I thinking? Oh, um, Williamsburg, that's it. Williamsburg. But yeah, definitely... Uh, <clears throat> definitely true folk music really takes you uh, back to the days of uh, Woody Guthrie, and um, <clears throat> and uh, I am now a fan, and uh, and now um, we would like to introduce two very special guests, um, and we're very honored to have um, two student activists from Iran, Madonna and Zoya. As they have a message for every for Americans on peace and international solidarity, so please take it away, Madonna and Zoya. Uh, so sorry, folks. Um, there's a little bit of um, a connection uh, problem with, uh, um, through Iran. Um, is it possible we could turn up the volume over there? Iran was a dependent country to the West without any independence. The West, especially America, made decisions instead of Shah and Iranian people. The military was completely depend dependent to the American orders. It was an obvious interfering in affairs of Iran. And now it continues in the Western Asia area as in Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, and so on. But now, after the Islamic Revolution, Iran has been a powerful and uh, independent country. For example, based on inter Intercept Report in 2017, Iran is known as the seventh most powerful country in the world. This political and uh, independence is a result of the Revolution Islamic Republic of Iran. The next about mil military independence, Pahlavi Shah tried to strengthen Iran's military by buying all kinds of Western weapons. On the other hand, Iran was considered as a storehouse of ammunition and was used on various occasions without Iran's permission. United States Defense Ministry describes Iran as the most powerful in missile power 
in the Western Asia. Democrats and Republicans have the same method in the face of Western Asia. Democrats' strategy shows that it doesn't want to get in war directly, but we know that it is proxy war. First of all, military and second, policy dimensions. In military dimensions, war trade by ISIS enhanced. Biden has claimed responsibility for the fight against ISIS with former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton acknowledging in her book, Difficult Choices, that ISIS was in fact created by the United States to divide the Middle East. And you saw in his first President's Day in Baghdad, it was happened terrorist attack by ISIS group. About 4,000 ISIS terrorists entered Iraq from Syria through as military vehicles under the American flag. First, what are the goals and motives of the United States and its allies in forming an anti-ISIS coalition? The sensitivity of this question becomes even greater when we know that the members gathered in the coalition were themselves the founder and main supporters of ISIS. The second question is what is the purpose of this coalition, which is actually composed of opponents of the Syria regime by attacking ISIS positions in Syria and Syria with their previous position, opposition to the Syria regime and its overthrow, no conflict. Former United States President Donald Trump has repeatedly stated that ISIS was created and supported by the United States government through Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And Biden supported it under Obama and now as President of the United States. From day one, when his government came to power, he and his deputy, Kamala Harris, also openly supported the strengthening of ISIS. Democrats have shown that in the political dimension, by pressuring the other side and negotiating with new challenges, it is pressuring Iran to return to its obligations under the UN Security Council under certain conditions or to bring Iran back to the negotiating table through sanctions and pressure such as this brings vision in all ways towards peace and conveys the message of peace to the world contrary to the United States war scenario. Iran has never started a war and militarily Iran has always acted defensively, not offensively, but will respond decisively to any of the enemy's war plans. War is a war of wills, and a strong will can win this war. The most powerful will is based on spirituality and religions. Religions that cannot stand up to the inhuman acts of lunatics like Trump and Biden are distorted and cannot peace and tranquility in the world. But Islam, contrary to Islamophobia, is a messenger of peace and security. As the Supreme Leader of the Islamic Revolution said, Islam becomes meaningful and realized with the trinity of justice, rationality and spirituality, and the political system of Islam, which arises from the trinity of rationality, spirituality and justice is Islamic democracy. The martyrdom and assassination of scientists is at the core of American, Arab and every coalition funded by Saudi Arabia, Zionist regime and the United States. The sabotage of Iran's nuclear sites such as Natanz is on the United States agenda while Iran seeks the peaceful use of nuclear energy, the American people have fallen victim to the Zionist regime ideology that governs American states, an American who can help preserve human values by choosing the right people. But 
the current United States President Biden declares that I am not a Jew, but a Zionist. Biden's deputy Harris also said that if there was no Israel, the United States should create Israel. The purpose of this triangle is to prevent any progress in the world. Follow the martyrdom of the martyrs are Fakhrizade and Ahmed Yoroshans. These were scientists who were looking for scientific progress for human beings. As Shahid Fakhrizade was doing scientific research on the corona vaccine, and now this Iranian vaccine, unlike the Pfizer foreign vaccine, an English vaccine, has been able to bring good results. The United States is the only country that has a history of nuclear attacks on defenseless countries and now claims to ensure peace and nuclear security, but accuses Iran. The United States has used nuclear weapons in Iraq, Fallujah, and Afghanistan and caused these humanitarian catastrophes. Babies born after these enemy attacks have lots of problems. All of this is the product of the United States anti-human nuclear activities. But what has Iran done? Iran, we use the use of nuclear energy peacefully for all and non-peacefully for any country. And in contrast to the American view, it is a look like sunlight that can be prevented. In the near future, Iran will increase its nuclear power and the United States embargo on science will not be able to prevent Iran from doing so. Iran will become nuclear and atomic and will move towards clean energy. Iran seeks progress in all dimensions, including religious, scientific, political, economic, and so on. Trump knew power in his nuclear suitcase, but it must be said that Mr. Trump, power is not in the nuclear suitcase. Power is in the will. The American people said not, no to you, and you are no longer president. But Iran has the will to have nuclear knowledge, and you are not a number who want to stop our progress. General Qasem Soleimani was who that Obama has said about him. He is my enemy, but I have a special respect for him. Arjun Curry said he'd like to see me as if it happened to me. However, the soldier of the Islamic homeland doesn't consider himself a politician. And it's Thompson is written soldier. Iran's strategy is defensive, not offensive. General Qasem Soleimani was martyred neither on the battlefield nor in his own country, but in a country where they were official guests. The drones are lifted at the best of the United States. As a result, it was an act called a terrorist government, not a terrorist group. Someone who claims to be a terrorist has done the same. Trump and Biden are like each other. They are a terrorist government. Trump's deputy said about General Qasem Soleimani that Qasem Soleimani's blood is more dangerous than Qasem Soleimani himself. It's true. For progress and peace in the region and for the world, we will drive the United States out of the region. America has no place on another continent and is constantly hostile from here. As a result, we will drive the United States out of the region. But the American people are different in this matter. If the American people can change their view and come to the conclusion that they have the right to Iran, unlike the Iranians, to give Yemen the right that the crime is being committed by Saudi Arabia in the United States, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and freedom seekers of the world, 
will give their rights. He will stand by the Avengers, fight for certainty. Both the perpetrators of the terrorism in the nation of the United States with the methodology of war, interference in human acts, and sub suburb. The idea from which the strategy model is extracted and produced. The result of this section is that we can have a world with peace and tranquility and without war and the value of human beings is respected in it. The dissolution of the United States is taking place in the economy, cultural and cultural spirits of civilization. In this event, the martyrdom of General Hossam Suleiman is accelerating this dissolution will be Wow, that was amazing, and and I was actually quite frightened, you know, looking at the scene of the bombing of uh, of of the uh, of the general, and and I want to give you my condolences as well, and um, <clears throat> and without a further ado, I. Would like to introduce the man of the hour uh, per se. Um, he is the, um, the you all know him as a, a well acclaimed journalist who has traveled extensively throughout the Middle East and uh, as well as um, the uh, host of uh, of um, of the live streams that we see every week. Please um, give it up for Caleb Maupin. Sure. Well, uh, I want to thank. Uh, our guests uh, who presented this evening. Um, uh, I want to thank our guests from Iran for joining us. Uh, it is certainly a, a very late hour, or perhaps I should say an early hour of the morning in Iran. So their presence uh, joining us is especially appreciated. And during the question and answer session, uh, we will no doubt have questions for them about Iran and about the international situation and about some of the lies that were told. I also want to thank uh, David Robix for that amazing performance. Um, really, really beautiful. Um, he is a very, very skilled songwriter uh, presenting a, a message of social justice and anti-imperialism uh, along with his, his well put together folk music. And you know, there's something very special about folk music in particular. Uh, communist movements and progressive and revolutionary movements often carry with them an element of folk music. Uh, I, I remember being a child and attending folk concerts and hearing the songs of Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger and other American folk singers who spoke about the working class and its struggle for justice. And at the time, I didn't know anything about socialism or Marxism or imperialism, um, but yet I heard this music um, and perhaps some of my inclination toward progressive ideas came from hearing such music. Um, it's interesting that Pete Seeger, uh, the well-known folk musician who eventually joined the Communist Party, uh, he originally studied Beethoven and Mozart and classical music at Harvard University. Um, but in 1936, he and his parents attended a folk concert in South Carolina to hear the music of working class people, the music of labor unions, the music, music of the African-American community, uh, the music of, of those in the mining towns and the working class people of America. And it was in 1936, after attending this folk music concert, that Pete Seeger not only decided to dedicate his life to performing folk music rather than classical music, uh, but it was also uh, at, after attending this concert that he decided to join the Communist Party and, and join the revolutionary movement. And if one looks around the world, uh, in China, uh, as the Communist Party of China was emerging and building a revolutionary movement and fighting against the Chiang Kai-shek government, uh, Edgar Snow, 
the journalist from the United States visited and became the first person to interview Mao Zedong. And when he interviewed Mao Zedong, uh, one of the things he noticed about the Red Army camp is that at the camp, the people at the Red Army camp were always singing. And they had taken some of the oldest, most well-known Chinese melodies and folk songs and rewritten the words to be in line with the Chinese Communist Party's vision of building a whole new country and driving out the imperialists and the capitalist system. And uh, it's very important that as those of us who are dedicated to changing the world, as we change the way we see things, as we learn to reject what Wall Street and the Pentagon through their media, mainstream media, want us to believe, as we learn to reject the messages uh, that are projected at us through social media. Um, wow, I put myself in the center there. Um, well, as, as we reject uh, the messages uh, that are pushed at us through social media, uh, that we learn to develop our own art and our own culture and our own music. And so folk music has always been very, very important. And when I heard David Rovix performing and singing that song about the fight against landlords. Uh, that makes me think about the Communist Party and the role that they played in the 1930s, fighting for the people that were struggling against home foreclosures and evictions, uh, how a number of states throughout the country passed moratoriums in response to the progressive struggle uh, of communists against the big landlords and bankers to fight for the right of working people to stay in their homes. Um, it was very very inspiring to hear David Rovix. Uh, I just, you know, the theme for my presentation tonight is living in a dying empire, because I think that we are very much living in the center of a dying empire. The United States and the imperialist system where a few monopolistic corporations dominate the world and beat down developing countries and wage wars against countries that assert their independence this global system of monopoly capitalism is coming to an end. And we are living in the United States, a country that has very much been at the center of that system for so very long. And we're watching an empire in decline. And we are living in a society uh, that is dealing with the effects of an empire reaching its conclusion. I think our Iranian friends in their video, they said, we're witnessing the dissolution of the United States. And uh, in very, very many ways, that seems to be the reality. But what do we do about that? Well, I want to draw some historical parallels and lessons uh, from the fall of the Roman Empire. Right? The Roman Empire was at one point uh, an empire that dominated much of the world, dominated Europe, dominated the Mediterranean, North Africa. Uh, but that empire came to an end. And the fall of the Roman Empire was something the founders of the United States thought quite a bit about. Uh, one of the best-selling books at the time of the, the founding of the United States of the American Revolution was Edward Gibbon's eight-volume history of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And you can bet that Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Alexander Hamilton were all reading Edward Gibbon as there weren't very many books printed back in that time. And that was one of the most cutting edge works of uh, social commentary and historical analysis that was being published, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And as they studied the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, they crafted the United States trying to learn some of the lessons from the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, and so the understanding of Rome and how Rome came to fall was pretty influential on the history of the United States and on the development of the United States. Um, now, why did the Roman Empire fall? You will hear all kinds of answers. Uh, if you look throughout you know, the work, there are people who say the Roman Empire fell because of lead in pipes and it made people crazy from of the lead in the pipes. Uh, people say the Roman Empire fell uh, because their culture uh, decayed and became more and more decadent or something like that. That's a standard conservative answer. Some people will say the Roman Empire fell uh, because people stopped believing in the Roman Empire. There are many, many idealist answers. But it's in the writing of Karl Kautsky, 
uh, the German Marxist, who wrote a very important book called The Foundations of Christianity, that we have a materialist analysis of why the Roman Empire fell. Well, the Roman Empire fell for the simple reason that slavery is a highly inefficient economic system. Think about it for a minute. What motivation does a slave have to work? Not very much. Right? A slave, they work because the slave master says, if you don't work, I will beat you. Or if you don't work, I will deprive you of food. And in a small scale, when the slave is in the same household as the, as the slave master, uh, there might be some motivation for the slave to contribute to the overall wealth of the household. But when the Romans, uh, as they had big, huge plantations, as they had big, huge mines, the motivation for the hundreds and hundreds of slaves that they brought in to extract minerals from the earth and to, uh, to uh, grow their crops uh, continued to decrease. And the, the more slaves you get, the harder it is to force those slaves to work, right? If you have 10 slaves, perhaps the slave master can stay on top of all 10 of them and tell them all to work. When you have 100 slaves or 1,000 slaves, it becomes less and less efficient. And the bigger the Roman Empire got, the more foreign slaves they brought in, the bigger their plantations and mines became, the less and less efficient the Roman Empire became. Uh, the industrial output of the Roman Empire was constantly decreasing. Their ability to grow their own crops decreased. Their ability to extract their own minerals and produce their own metal tools decreased. The bigger and more powerful the Roman Empire got, the weaker it became from within. And Rome was basically a military society. And they made up, as their agricultural output and industrial output decreased, they made up for it by plundering other people's crops and plundering other people's minerals and you know, pointing, pointing countries around the world, pointing their spears at them and taking the people from those countries as, as slaves. And the Roman Empire was essentially built on a very, very reactionary system. Slavery was an outmoded economic system. And across the world, many of the peoples that the Romans conquered had adopted a, a different system called feudalism. And feudalism is a much more efficient system than slavery. Under feudalism, every peasant or serf has their individual tract of land. And they work the land, and they pay their obligation to the landlord or the, the noble, but then they get to keep what's left over. So there's much more of an, uh, uh, an incentive for a peasant to work than there is for a slave to work. A serf or a peasant uh, has a far, far higher motivation to work. And as a result, feudalism is a much more efficient system than the system that the Romans kept called slavery. So what the Romans were doing is they were going around to parts of the world that had the feudal system and taking them over and forcing them to pay tribute. And essentially they were holding back history. The wheels of history had turned, the slave system was being replaced by a more efficient system. and the Romans, um, they essentially uh, were trying to hold back history. And ultimately, the reason that the Roman Empire was not sustainable was because it was an outmoded economic system and there was a higher mode of production in existence. And that is ultimately the reason for the fall of the Roman Empire. It was rooted in economics and it was rooted in the drive for a higher mode of production. Rome was holding back history. It was a reactionary empire. And so the Roman Empire eventually met its conclusion. Um, and I think you can draw a parallel to the United States. We maintain the free market capitalist system here in the United States. The rule of profits, profits in command. And this is highly, highly irrational. If you compare the way socialist countries like Vietnam or Cuba or China have reacted to the pandemic, to the way the United States has been able to handle it. You can see that this system of allowing every capitalist and every corporation to do what they want, this system of allowing rich and powerful people to control the means of production is a highly inefficient system. And when societies face big crises like the pandemic, uh, the ability of society to be mobilized in response to big disasters uh, is very, very weak. And countries that are much poorer and at a much lower level uh, economically, 
but yet countries that have broken out of the capitalist system uh, have been able to handle the pandemic far, far more effectively. And that seems to indicate that capitalism is outmoded. Um, when I watched the presentation from our Iranian friends, uh, it made me deeply, deeply sad to see uh, how the United States has been around the world. To think that the United States of America, the country that I grew up in, uh, the country that, that I've lived in my whole life, uh, you know, I, that it's associated with empire and war and destruction. It's associated with plundering countries and beating people down and destroying people and, and heartless assassinations and drone strikes. It brings me great sadness because I know that this evil being perpetrated by the bankers and billionaires and militarists who run the United States does not represent all of what America is about. This is also the country that brought us John Brown, the heroic abolitionist who launched his raid on Harper's Ferry, trying to destroy slavery. This is also the country that had Harriet Tubman, the slave revolutionary, as the first woman ever to lead soldiers into battle, and Harriet Tubman leading, leading freed slaves along the Kambahi River during the American Civil War. This is the country of Eugene Debs. This is the country of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. This is the country of Gus Hall. Uh, this is the country of so many progressive, peace-loving people who have stood against empire. But yet, around the world, people don't see this side of America. Instead, they see the reactionary side. They just see the destructive side. They see the Donald Trump side. They see the, un the, the ugly side of the United States, the ugly curse of settler colonialism, uh, the ugly realities of a society founded on slavery, and the slaughter of the indigenous people. And it seems like the reactionary forces that have been in power in the United States for so long have done a very good job of convincing people around the world that they represent what America is all about, that they are America, and that and they've done a good job of convincing Americans that as well. So many young, progressive-minded people, uh, as they become socialists and revolutionaries, uh, they become convinced uh, that, that they must no longer be Americans, uh, that this means they must uh, burn the American flag. This means they must, they must denounce the country they live in. The progressive side of who we are as Americans, the abolitionists, the suffragists, the human rights activists, the labor unionists, the, the anti-war and peace movements of this country have been erased from public consciousness. And this is very disturbing. And my my hope is that with the Center for Political Innovation and Students and Youth for a New America, we can show the world the progressive side of America. We can say that Donald Trump and Sarah Palin and uh, Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, they aren't what America is all about. And in fact, they are backed and tied financially to the very people that are destroying this country. As they bomb and destroy countries around the world, uh, they are also uh, they are also destroying working class communities across the United States. Clean drinking water is not available in many parts of the country. People drink water contaminated. In many parts of the United States, uh, we have a situation where the roads are being unpaved. They have a machine called a reclaimer, and it pulls up the asphalt and pulverizes it, replacing uh, a dirt road or, or a paved road with a dirt road. And this is because municipalities across the United States cannot afford to maintain paved roads. I mean, the United States is crumbling from within, but our leaders are not concerned about that. They are committed to this project of securing the monopoly of gigantic corporations and their ability to reap profits from all over the world. They're not really concerned about the fact that average Americans' incomes are going down, American communities are falling apart, so many people are suffering. Uh, and the needs of average Americans have been disregarded. And instead, the needs of a global financial empire for Wall Street and London, for the Pentagon, uh, their drive to dominate the world seems to take far more priority uh, than, than the interests of average American working people. And American working people from all parts of the country, from all different political perspectives are angry. 
And when we saw that horrendous raid on the Capitol, that, that you know, violent attack that took place on January 6th, uh, underlying th that, I think, was desperation. I think there are many working people in this country who are confused, they're afraid, they're upset, and in their desperation, they turn to demagogues like Trump or mass movements the, and deceptive conspiracy theories like QAnon uh, in the hopes of, of somehow alleviating their suffering. Um, and I think this is an opportunity. Uh, this is a real opportunity for the people of the world that are, that are struggling to resist empire and the domination of Western banks and corporations and the people of the United States who are struggling to, as their country is being destroyed by multinational corporations and imperialists. This is a moment in which there can be solidarity, which the people of the developing world in their struggle for freedom and the people of the United States and their struggle for freedom can come together and stand against empire and stand against war and militarism. And this is my hope, is that we can awaken, the American working class can awaken and realize that the, the enemies and the people that are destroying the lives of working people across this country are not in Iran, they're not in Venezuela, they're not in Russia or China or Cuba. The, the enemies of America's working people are the American ruling class. The vision that I've often put forward is a four-step program to reinvent the country. Imagine if instead of sending soldiers all over the world to bomb and destroy and, and attack countries, we had a government that mobilized the young people of the United States to rebuild the country, to, to go out and build high-speed railway, build new universities, build new water systems and new power plants, uh, to pave the roads of our communities. And we, and we mobilized the young people of the United States to go out in a mass effort to construct a whole new country. Imagine that we had a government that said that the oil and the natural gas of the United States and the coal and the timber and all the natural resources of this land shouldn't be owned by big multinational corporations, but should instead be the property of the people. And the profits made from our natural resources went into the public budget to pay for schools and housing, not into the pockets of big corporations. Imagine that our banking system was no longer run by, by private banks, but instead we had a government that lended money uh, in the interests of the community overall. Um, and we strategically planned out what was good for the country with the state having a monopoly on credit. Imagine then we could guarantee an economic bill of rights, a right to housing, a right to jobs, a right to education, to secure that everyone in the country is taken care of and no one is left behind. If those four steps were enacted, uh, that would be the first step in completely reinventing the United States. Now, it's interesting because in the legal profession, uh, they will talk about what they call fruit of a poison tree. And that means that if, if the way something is originated is corrupt, uh, the result is also corrupt, right? I, I believe in the Islamic tradition, they talk about haram. And the idea is that, you know, if, if, you, know, if you steal food, uh, when you eat it, it might make you sick. Uh, or if you, if you get a, a, a loan to build your home, but the loan violates the Islamic law uh, and is, is an irreligious or un-Islamic loan, uh, the house might, might crumble or catch on fire. And the understanding is that if something is created in a corrupt way, it's cursed, it's tainted. And I think that this understanding, that if something is created in a corrupt way, it is cursed and tainted, really applies to the United States. The United States was created with the genocide of Native Americans. It was created with the transatlantic slave trade. And the United States was created in a very corrupt way, and it's maintained its power uh, through war and militarism and destruction. And for a long time, that war and militarism and destruction, uh, it resulted in the creation of a, a prosperous middle class in the homeland. We talk about the, you know, the labor aristocracy, the, uh, the good paying, well paid American industrial worker who had a house and a car and 2.5 children, uh, leave it to beaver, etc. But at the same time in the 1950s that the USA had a booming economy, 50s, 60s, even up into the 70s, uh, during that time, all those houses, all those cars, all those hula hoops, uh, they were all dripping with blood. They were dripping with blood of the colonized people around the world. They were dripping with blood of the Korean people and the Vietnamese people. 
and they were dripping with the blood of the black people who lived under Jim Crow segregation, and the Chicano people who were treated as second-class citizens in their own homeland. And, and even the prosperous time in the United States was tainted. If you look at material from the 1950s, movies from the 1950s, there was an, an understanding that something was not right. Underneath it all, uh, there was something sinister. Right after World War II, uh, in 19, 1948, I believe, 1947, uh, people in the United States started talking about flying saucers and UFOs. And there started to be this paranoia that somehow we were going to be attacked from outer space. And it was, it was a mass delusion. Uh, but it was based on the fact that they knew something wasn't right. Even though the Second World War had ended, even though the USA was prosperous, there was still this fear. And that's when movies in U.S. culture uh, about monsters destroying cities like Godzilla or King Kong or the giant moth or the giant uh, spider or whatever it was became so popular. So many disaster movies came because Americans seemed to know that there was a disaster on the horizon, that this prosperity that was based on empire and exploitation could not last. There was, there was something about the prosperity created by imperialism that made it naturally unsustainable. And some kind of horrendous disaster was on the horizon. The, the, the results of the actions of empire kind of haunted us as an American, as an American people, as a population. But now, you know, we fast forward to 2008 and the financial crisis, and now amid the pandemic, it's very clear that the ruling class of the United States has decided they no longer need a comfortable, stable middle class at home. They no longer need an aristocracy of labor, and they are demolishing, demolishing the American ruling class and, and destroying the domestic economy of the United States. What they've done to so many countries around the world, they are now in the process of gradually every, every day doing to America's working families. They are driving the United States into further poverty so they can set up one global financial dictatorship based on the rule of huge multinational corporations. And in a way you could say this is the worst of times. And you, in a way you could say this is a time in which we have to live in utter pessimism and hopelessness. But I don't see it that way. I say that now is a time with which we can be full of hope. Now is a time for solidarity. Imagine, imagine a situation like what happened this summer, where an act of police brutality was seen on television, and not only did the black community go out and protest, but the white community went out and protested, the Latino community went out and protested, Asian Americans went out and protested, Arab Americans went out and protested, the whole country came together against the killing of George Floyd in an act of unprecedented solidarity. And the government was terrified and, and it couldn't believe the explosion of popular power that was taking place. And what was really happening was that the American working class, white, black, Asian, Latino, Arab, is tired of the economic crisis and the unfolding police state. And the sleeping giant of America's working families is awakening. And there are efforts by the Donald Trump, QAnon, right-wing movement to turn that anger into racism and anti-immigrant bigotry and demagogy. And there are efforts by the liberal crowd and, you know, the, the you know, I don't know what you want to call them, the, the synthetic left, to turn that anger into identity politics where we, instead of fighting the ruling class, we tear each other down in, in battles and accusations and, and allegations of and debates about who's the most privileged, et cetera. But I think that the class struggle and the struggle of working people to come together and abolish capitalism, that struggle is what is really on the horizon. And in such a time, we are really, really lucky. We are really lucky to be alive, to be in the generation that will overturn capitalism in the United States, to be part of the generation that will build a socialist America. Revolution was not possible in the 1960s. Revolution was not possible in the 1930s. But as the capitalist system is collapsing and as the empire internationally is collapsing, there is a real possibility of a whole new America being created. And when we talk about socialism with American characteristics, we're saying that the socialism that emerges here in the United States, it won't be Chinese socialism, it won't be Russian socialism, Venezuelan socialism, Korean socialism. It will be a socialism rooted in America's unique conditions. It will be a socialism that addresses the problems existing in American society at this very hour. 
and it will be the American people in their millions who will create that socialism. But there's no question that the country must be reborn, right? I talked about fruit of a poison tree. I talked about, uh, I talked about the, the way that, that the country was founded. The country will have to be reborn on new values, kindness, brotherhood, sisterhood, compassion, solidarity, right? We, we won't be simply trying to fix up and repair the, the old system. We'll be building a whole new country. We'll be building a whole new country where profits are no longer in command and trade can be done on the basis of win-win cooperation. I think what the China, what China is doing with the Belt and Road Initiative right now, as they trade with developing countries and China gets wealthier and the countries they trade with get wealthier in the process, win-win cooperation, that could be a model. Imagine the United States and China and Russia coming together to you know, cure cancer, to overcome uh, you know, problems like, like the fuel, uh, you know, the fossil fuel-based economy, create fusion energy. Imagine, you know, having intercontinental high-speed railway systems. Imagine going to outer space to acquire new resources, uh, you know, acquiring uh, natural resources, not just from, from this earth, but from the moon, as China has already started doing, uh, from Mars, from Jupiter, from Saturn, developing space probes that could get us new energy sources. The possibilities, the possibilities, once capitalism and imperialism are removed, the possibilities for humanity are massive. We are actually living in a time full of great potential. And this can be a time that's very alienating. This can be a time in which so many of us are, are hopeless and worried and scared. But I think we should be optimistic. And a, an important part of our optimism is that we must always be clear that we don't advocate violence. We don't advocate destruction. We don't advocate terrorism. We would favor a peaceful transition to socialism. We would favor moving towards socialism in a way in which all of America's people could come together and through the democratic process enact a new system. And we don't wanna bring destruction and chaos. It's capitalism that's bringing destruction and chaos. It's capitalism that's bringing instability. It's capitalism that's bringing violence. We want peace. We want justice. However, at the same time that we recognize that we are not advocates of destruction, the capitalists of the United States and the ruling class are very vicious. And we, we doubt very much that they would, they would be willing to allow the people to exercise their democratic rights. But never has any genuine socialist revolution come through communists advocating violence or advocating terrorism or advocating acts of destruction. It has only been through advocating a peaceful transition to a socialist society and mobilizing the people to try and bring that about um, and, and forcing the capitalists into a situation where they have to decide if they're going to allow the democratic process to continue or if they are going to resort to violence and terror to, to hold the people back. That is how the transition to socialism has been successful. Um, and so we have to be absolutely clear about that. We don't want to destroy America. America is already being destroyed by capitalism. We want a whole new America built on a new foundation of justice and solidarity and brotherhood, sisterhood, community. And we are living in a very exciting time. These times are so full of suffering and, and fear, but at the same time, they're full of great potential. And uh, my, hope, uh, my hope is that across this country, the Center for Political Innovation, students and youth for a new America and other progressive minded people can, can show the American people that the problem, the problem isn't immigrant workers, the problem isn't Muslims, the problem is capitalism. And the way out is building a new America, fighting for a government of action that will fight for working families. That is, that is the vision I hope the Center for Political Innovation can put forward. Uh, and I've really been happy to be on this webcast. I want to thank our international guests once again, and I hope we can have a great Q&A discussion. Uh, this has been a great webcast. Let's have a good conversation. All right. Thank you so much again, Caleb. And um, I'm pretty sure that everyone here would like to hear um, a few words uh, we'd like to hear from um, Madonna and uh, Zoya themselves. So, um, Madonna, Zoya, is there anything you would like to uh, say to everyone on the conference? I 
And you need to unmute, Zoya. You're muted. Hello to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, merciful. Uh, hello to all. And uh, I wanted to mm, thank you, Mr. Mopin, uh, for your speech. Uh, your opinion is very, very near to our uh, opinion in Islam. And uh, what we know about America and uh, what we want to know every people around the world about Islam. Um, first of all, let me uh, congratulate this um, 42nd anniversary of Islamic revolution to all Iranian and also to the uh, all libertarians around the world. Um, I think your opinions um, about Islam and uh, about the history of America and uh, all the world uh, is very true. Uh, any, um, every uh, cruel attack around the world uh, is because of uh, some um, wants the um, Zionist regime want to do. I mean, uh, and during the Zionist regime is alive, no country around the world uh, won't have a calm life. Uh, now Iran, um, which is, um, which is uh, not uh, agree with this Zionist regime uh, is powerful because of uh, having faithful and knowledge used. Uh, and uh, this, cause, uh, this causes my country to prove in scientific and military aspects. Um, Islam uh, will be the most powerful power around the world, um, nearly, by our um, uh, uh, our real person, uh, who is the son of our prophet. Um, I prefer you and uh, all the mm, young people around the world that. Um, read the letter of uh, Imam Khamenei to all young uh, people around the world. Uh, he mm, said in this letter that, um, I prefer you that uh, get familiar with Islam by the correct source. Um, you said, um, our friend said that, uh, how can I help people? Uh, we can help people by uh, getting knowledge to them. We can help people by, by um, making them know about what is happening in America, around the world. Uh, we can uh, help people by knowing uh, what America uh, is doing um, under the um, Zionist uh, regime things. Uh, what uh, Zionist regime wills, uh, and then America do it. Um, I prefer all American and all people all over the world uh, study and read uh, the history of um, America and uh, Iran especially. Uh, learn more about the um, history uh, of Iran and America, what America do uh, in Shah's time, and uh, what is it uh, what it is doing now. Uh, what is uh, America and um, America government? I mean, uh, doing with um, our people with um, the people of uh, Western Asia area. Uh, it is just because of uh, getting more brief to the Zionist regime and uh, keeping it more alive and more alive uh, to um, chill more and uh, get this 
um, six more around the world. Uh, I don't know, I have a, uh, say what I want. Um, thank you, I, thank you very much. Thank you, Zoya, for, uh, for that wonderful speech. <clears throat> and <clears throat> and, um, and Madonna, would you like to say anything as well? If someone could just uh, click on her screen. Hello, folks. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. And uh, thank you for... Uh, Think uh, for intervention. Um, your speech, Mr. Mopin, uh, I uh, it's so good. But um, I think uh, the parts of uh, your speech is is not uh, true. But uh, it, this is my belief. Uh, you you said that. Um, we never see uh, another side of America. That uh, America is uh, is um, not just for a uh, war and uh, not just for uh, genocide or uh, the bad of a uh, side uh, in the world. Not not this, um, but always. Um, and unfortunately, uh, in the earth and in the world, uh, um, all of the wars and uh, uh, all of the wars and uh, all of the uh, genocide um, in America is in it, and why? And uh, for example, in the Middle East, uh, but uh, we don't say Middle East, uh, we must say uh, uh, West Asia. This is true and this is correct. Um, why, why America soldiers are in Iraq? Why? Why um, America soldiers in Afghanistan, in Syria? And um, what uh, what's looking for in uh, other countries? And uh, these soldiers are um, innocent, and uh, maybe they uh, kill. And um, why why um, America soldiers are in other countries and and um, uh, can uh, and want to um, sorry um, want to same uh, uh, intervention one uh, intervention to uh, other countries and why and uh, and other uh, and other case that. For example, uh, now in uh, we are in pandemic, and um, one of the uh, I think uh, uh, one of the official U.S. officials said about that about uh, Wild West uh, that uh, Wild West was alive. Why? Uh, because uh, some people, some uh, America people. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, and uh, attack to stores that uh, buy masks or other uh, tools that, uh, special for coronavirus, because um, this is uh, for, and uh, this is vital and this is uh, necessary for healthy. But uh, why uh, people um, arguments to us? And um, to them, that uh, uh, acts this, or um, other uh, examples that, uh, for example, 
many people, many poor people now are in uh, streets and why uh, America government uh, don't, uh, sorry, uh, don't do anyone, why? And uh, why uh, America government's attention to uh, their people, their America people, why uh, always uh, want to intervention to other countries? And um, why, uh, why America country? Uh, I, when I say America country, that means policy. America and uh, po um, political uh, America, uh, it's uh, not humanity. And uh, it's um, unhumanity. And um, for example, um, General Qasem Soleimani, and uh, yes, this pixel, uh, picture his. Uh, General Qasem Soleimani was a man and was a commander uh, that saved all the people in the world, not just Yemen, not just Syria, Afghanistan, or Iraq, because uh, he <coughs> fights to ISIS group. ISIS group um, were um, in Europe, America, and um, who is uh, who is create ISIS group? Who is uh, America? America uh, country? America government is better. Yeah, uh, create it, and it's very obviously because um, Trump. Yeah, uh, Trump. Um, said this, that uh, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton um, create ISIS group. And ISIS group kill all people that's innocent. And why? Uh, why go America government uh, help and uh, help to this terrorist group? And after that, um, this government, this America government, say that Iran is terrorist country. Why? And what's the meaning of terrorist? If terrorists that um, um, make peace or make safe and all, uh, all all people, this is this is terrorist or um, kill people and um, not any uh, peace in the world and sorry oh, sorry my watch is well and uh, why um, uh, what's the meaning of terrorist um, for example for example uh, shahid uh, master uh, dr fakhri he was a nuclear scientist in Iran, and uh, he studied he studied uh, nuclear energy, and uh, by used to peaceful way, not um, make atomic bomb or uh, etc. And uh, why America country America government uh, killed him? And um, because he 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 just uh, progress uh, to scientists, and he he uh, he studied to coronavirus too, and um, now uh, Iran Waxon uh, that uh, has a good uh, result uh, because for st uh, study of Doctor uh, Shahid Fakhrizade, okay. And uh, I think, I think, uh, and uh, I believe that America people are, uh, uh, are, uh, aren't uh, like governments. Uh, because uh, you are, you are, uh, you are a, 
uh, you are a um, human that uh, feel that uh, humanity, but uh, your government, your governments, uh, and in your uh, historic of America, uh, we saw that uh, America governments and uh, always, always, uh, uh, always uh, want to uh, war and fight and uh, and uh, follow this. And uh, but America people uh, like young uh, young America people. Uh, I remember that uh, one letter uh, about. Um, our leader, our supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, to young people, uh, to America young people, that uh, this is very important. And I suggest to uh, this uh, young America people that uh, are in life, um, search in Google and read it. Um, you are separate. You are separate from your government. And you can change this game because uh, because uh, you are separated. You are separate from your government. Government um, is um, a government has has a lot of evil things, and uh, and this uh, political is very is very wrong. And uh, but you can. Uh, you can change this uh, if you want. If you want, you can. But, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, now it's as on time for, say, prayers in Iran. Sorry. And um, you can change this uh, if you want. Because... Uh, Sorry, um, because because uh, this way, this way are uh, aren't uh, this way uh, doesn't have the uh, good uh, the good end, okay? Uh, because uh, we know that uh, America government will be uh, destroyed uh, very soon, like a titanic uh, ship. And uh, um, this, is, this is a fact, because uh, all of the, uh, all of us, we know uh, that uh, right, right is win in all of the case, but um, um, sorry, uh, but uh, on right is not been, and uh, but uh, I think uh, the first uh, point important that uh, you uh, you must to uh, think you must to think that and uh, okay I'm for example I'm American. Uh, citizen and um, I'm American and I live in for example New York City and uh, okay and uh, why uh, why that uh, when uh, I live in this city and this country and uh, why our uh, why my government uh, war to other country and kill all all the people um, most of the people that they don't have any um, seen and uh, and what is my uh, responsible that uh, all uh, about uh, those people and um, for example um, I have I have mother father sister or brother and those people have them and uh, why why uh, kill and why they want? Uh, why they uh, 
must to kill and and don't leave. Uh, for example, in Yemen, in Yemen, a uh, hundred children are there. And, uh, And in Yemen, uh, we uh, we know um, hungry ch uh, hungry children, and uh, this is not uh, humanity. And America government say always about human rights. Okay, human rights this. Uh, why uh, you always act uh, anti human rights, anti uh, this that. And uh, anti uh, about safe and uh, acts of uh, terrorists, uh, and why uh, you always do it, and then say no, we are uh, and uh, we follow human rights. This is joking. This is not real, because uh, human rights is in isn't that uh, kill people and um, just um, think. Um, about uh, about yourself, okay? And uh, I think um, the the life of all people in the world is important, and uh, we uh, we must to uh, continue this way together. Uh, Iran country, America or other countries can. Um, Unique together for uh, for creating a peace world and uh, without any war, without any war. But but uh, now and uh, now uh, in this situation and especially especially in the Biden government, uh, we saw that uh, Democrats and uh, didn't want to uh, peace in the world. And uh, the first day of um, President Biden, uh, we saw that in Baghdad, uh, terrorist attack, and um, most of people killed in this. And, um, and why? Why uh, you, want, uh, you want to uh, intervention to other countries and uh, in West Asia and uh, what look for um, yes and uh, I think um, we uh, we can we can uh, unite together and uh, broke this uh, this mind this evil mind that uh, uh, they're in here and they're in your country. And uh, now uh, we know that uh, Trump, Trump is, uh, is terrorist and Biden like, uh, like he, him. And um, two, uh, both of them are like together and no different between. And um, and um, Trump uh, did um, a bad and uh, uh, worse um, work that uh, terror and, and terror General Qasem Soleimani. General Qasem Soleimani uh, safe and um, he he always tried to save. Uh, life of people, and uh, he never, he never kill uh, people. That um, he never kill people. Just he uh, he kill um, ISIS group, ISIS group, and uh, other uh, terrorist groups. And um, at soon uh, we know, and um, and we will see that. Uh, uh, Less of 25 years, less of 25 years, and um, in this world, we don't have any uh, Israel in our a earth. And, and because because uh, the starter of this, all of the works, uh, 
related to Zionist regime. And Zionist regime and uh, governments in America, both of them are... Uh, Sorry. And um, are together that uh, do this uh, terrorist uh, works and um, kill most of people, Zionist regime and America government. And um, I hope that one day, one day, um, uh, will uh, be that. Uh, we are uh, together and uh, without without any war and uh, without any um, zionist regime and uh, without any uh, uh, evil politicals and and uh, live together uh, by peace thank you thank you for watching and i'm so sorry for my language, uh, sorry, because I'm a foreigner and my um, uh, main language is not English. And uh, I'm so sorry. And thank you. Thank you for watching and waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Madonna. That was very, that was, <clears throat> we are very thank honored you. for you and Zoya to speak with us tonight. And um, I gotta say, Madonna, you're quite popular. <laughs> With the uh, all the uh, buzzing and the phone calls. Anyway, um, also, um, if anyone uh, wants to, please check out uh, David Rock um, Rovix at patreoncom slash David Rovix and to uh, in order to support his music. And now uh, we are going to be taking questions. Uh, we're going to be at the Q. This is the Q and A's uh, portion. So. Um, Lily has a question for Caleb, I believe. Actually, I think I um, had a question for Max. Oh, um, excuse me. So, yeah. I meant, uh, I meant you had a question for Lily. Excuse my, my apologies. Yeah. Um, uh, Max, I wanted to ask you, you know, you gave your presentation about, about some of the, the work you had done uh, in the communities around D.C., and I was wondering if you could describe some of the conversations um, that, that you had with people while you did some of this mass organizing and work, um, not just with the people in the community, but also with some of the people doing this work with you. And were you able to engage with people um, on a, at a political level while you were engaging in this kind of activity? Right. Yeah, of course. Um, as a Marxist, it's very important to, while you're doing this kind of work, to engage politically with people while you're doing this work. And yes, I was able to engage with people. People, like, especially like a lot of the people that we're feeding, like they understand the problems. They see the houses that are unoccupied and that could belong to them where they could like sleep warm, where they wouldn't have to, you know, live in a tent. And they, they see this economic contradiction. This economic contradiction isn't just indirect for them. They don't have to discover it. It's right. They can feel it in their stomachs. They can feel it like when the, in the cold winter, when in their tent, like it's right apparent to them and they know what's up. And in terms of interacting with like other activists, uh, my main, um, I'd just like to shout, shout out um, the Paul Robeson Club um, of the Communist Party USA that's active in DC. Um, they have done a lot of good work like in this poverty relief alongside Stints and Youth for New America and the Total Liberation Collective in DC. Um, and honestly, like, Specific, like, I feel that like a lot of leftists, we get wrapped up in this these Twitter wars between, oh, you're a you're a Marxist Leninist, oh, you're a Marxist Leninist Maoist, oh, you're a Hojist. These small differences in ideology don't matter when you get to the ground level. When people aren't, when people are sleeping in tents, when people are homeless, when people you know are waking up and like they and they have to like clear their tent because there's rats inside their tent taking away what little food they have. Like these conditions that people are living in, like people need, like all Marxists who are currently active on Twitter, if you're debating people on Twitter, go outside, go to your community, talk with people, go to the places that have been abandoned by the capitalists, provide what aid you can and talk with these people and organize 
if we spent half the effort that we do on online debating nonsense and nonsensical things about countries that unfortunately have been consumed or are dead because of Western imperialism, we're not going to get anywhere. And I feel that a lot of Marxists in the U.S. like we need we need a dose of reality. Like they, like look at our just look outside, just look at our communities, and I promise you, you will get more fulfillment out of doing this type of work that Stinson Youth for a New America is doing on the local level in the Beltway region, which is DC, Maryland, and Northern Virginia, you will get more out of it than you will get out of any squalor or bullshit on Twitter. And um, I'd just like to shout out, um, if you are in with, if you are in the Beltway region, um, DC, Northern Virginia, or Southern Maryland, um, or you just wanna set up a branch of students and you for New America in your local, in your local area, um, our official email so far is, um, S-Y-N-A dot Beltway at gmail.com. Um, that's all lowercase, I repeat, S-Y-N-A dot Beltway at gmail.com. And we need everyone we can get. We need to unite, regardless of tiny differences, regardless of whatever there is. We need to help people, and we need to do mass work in our country if we're going to survive like as a movement and as a people. Because the billionaires on Wall Street, the looters, the, the crooks, all of those people, they don't care about the American people. They don't care about the people out on the streets. They don't care about the people in their apartments that are struggling to pay rent. They don't care about people who have to foreclose on their housing. They don't care. And we are the people who actually do care. So it's up to us to organize and fight back against the imperialists, the capitalists, and the robbers. Uh, hey, I just had a question for uh, either Zohar or Madonna about Iran. Um, so we know there are elections coming up this year uh, in Iran. And uh, I was wondering what your thoughts on it uh, are. I've, I've heard there's a lot of talk about possibly the former president Ahmadinejad running again, and uh, he might have a good chance. So I just want to hear just your thoughts generally on the elections. Zoya, you're oh, you got on. Speak. May I answer again your question? Yes. Thank you. Would you please repeat your question? Oh, oh yes, yes. Um, what are your thoughts on the uh, elections in Iran this year? Um, I think um, the revolution, yes, uh, young people, um, revolutionary young people uh, want to and uh, must to uh, come in power uh, in the government. Um, I didn't understand what you say about Ahmadinejad, but um, what uh, we know about him uh, is that he get um, distance, get uh, more distance from our leather, leather, and uh, when he was a, a revolution, a revolutionary man, uh, he was accepted with us. But uh, little by little, he get uh, more distance from uh, the um, revolutionary. Uh, ideals. Uh, we hope that um, the next uh, government in Iran uh, would be a revolutionary government uh, to um, help uh, the country and help the uh, this area, uh, Western Asia area, uh, to how uh, the best more. Mm, better policy, better, uh, how better policy uh, for um, mm, for uh, getting the area um, uh, back from the Zionist regime. Uh, it's really related to our government policy. 
uh, and it's really related to uh, all uh, other countries in this area. Um, if the country and if the governments uh, in this area um, uh, help to uh, American thinking uh, and to um, Zionist regime, uh, we would not have uh, an Islamic area and would not have uh, reached to uh, uh, Islamic world and uh, we would not have uh, reached to peace, the real peace, the completely peace around the world. Um, I don't know, how can I answer your question or not? All right. Um, <clears throat> Uh, say, uh, I think I, um, I think there was a, uh, a question from Justin Simmons in the ch super chat. Yeah, if somebody could read that, that would be great. Uh, I can read the, the first one, the earlier one. Okay. Uh, so he said, <clears throat> I do have a question for Iranian speakers. How should the average American work to promote peace and understanding between the United States and Iran in the public sphere? I have lost your voice. Oh, he said, um, one second. how can average Americans work to promote peace between America and Iran? What would, uh, what? Would you please can, repeat? Yes, I, sure. Um, how can uh, Americans, how can, can you hear me? Yes. It, okay. How can uh, uh, people in America promote peace with Iranians? And how can we stop our American aggression against your country? Uh, mm, how Americans, I think uh, Americans, um, people, American people are very near to um, our opinion. Their opinion is near to our opinion. Uh, I think um, they uh, want freedom. Uh, they want to be um, in a justice world. Uh, I think they, uh, as Mr. Mopin said, they have uh, lots of hope to have a good world and um, get near to uh, such a word. Uh, I think um, American people should um, know something, should uh, read more something. Uh, as I said uh, in my speech, um, American people should uh, read about their history, should about read, uh, read about uh, our history. Iranian history and American history is uh, and was very near together. Uh, we have we have some um, um, some same um, memories uh, in past. Uh, we have seen um, some uh, affects of the American government in our country. Uh, and we can uh, get uh, joined to the uh, same opinion. Uh, if uh, Iranian people know more about American history, and on the other side, the American people know more about Iranian history and, the, uh, and about um, Western Asia history, um, I think uh, something will be solved very easily. Uh, the most uh, important thing and the base uh, important uh, base thing is that uh, the people uh, should and must know something. Uh, and you uh, and all other activists uh, around the world or in America uh, 
must do it, must uh, get people familiar with these facts, uh, with this fact that uh, what is happening around the world, what is uh, uh, happening in Asia area, uh, Western Asia area, uh, what is happening by uh, American government. Uh, and uh, as they know, really, and uh, we uh, saw that uh, American uh, has uh, had uh, some um, protests against uh, their government and against the Zionist regime. Uh, but um, I think uh, this uh, information would be, um, would be more. This information uh, and this uh, knowledge about uh, the facts um, which is happening would be more um, learned to people. And uh, one other aspect uh, that uh, I think um, the Muslim has uh, have is that um, you and the American people um, should uh, should not fear, you know, um, uh, a little fear maybe uh, get you back from your uh, idols thinking. Um, I think um, me and uh, lots of Iranian people don't fear from. Um, for example, American government, and don't fear from uh, seeing this regime. And what is happening in Lebanon and uh, in Palestine, in Iraq and Yemen, is that uh, the soldiers, uh, Islamic soldiers, don't uh, afraid of these um, attacks. Uh, I don't know how can I. Say my uh, can I say voice. something? Can I say? Uh, to continue this answer, um, your question is related that uh, now we are in uh, five decades in Iran about Iran's revolution, and uh, this is uh, the most and the most important happened in Iran that. Iran uh, can uh, uh, can uh, independence and uh, can have independence and uh, without uh, dependence and uh, by Imam Khomeini and uh, this revolution is success and uh, was successful because uh, our leader our leader uh, was Imam Khomeini, Imam Khomeini, um, who uh, who is who was the uh, the main and uh, and uh, the uh, the brave and uh, man and uh, like my friend that said uh, you don't know afraid and uh, for uh, of and uh, that uh, it's. Uh, maybe problem to you. You don't uh, afraid. Uh, why? Why uh, Iranian people want to revolution? Why? Because uh, in Shah's time, uh, people people uh, were the bad situation and um, with uh, with not uh, uh, victory and uh, with not uh, any, uh, sorry, with not uh, any freedom. And uh, they, and Iran uh, was the dependent country, not independent. And um, this is, this is the, uh, this is very problem. And this was very problem. And um, people, people want to change this, um, uh, situation 
And uh, you know that, um, for example, uh, some weeks ago in America, in Washington, D.C., uh, people uh, went to uh, Sena and uh, uh, Sena uh, Parliament and uh, just for uh, that uh, they believe that, uh, for example, we want to uh, continue to, uh, by Trump, not Biden. Okay, uh, they they can they can uh, they could to uh, enter to parliaments because they want. So if you want to change this uh, situation, uh, you must uh, and you need uh, one uh, you need a powerful leader. First, it's very important. Uh, for example, uh, we saw um, in history that um, all of the, um, that revolution, um, for example, France revolution or other countries, but it's not, uh, it wasn't um, successful. But now we are in a four, uh, 40 seconds of Iran revolution that uh, it's, uh, it's, here and uh, uh, there is, and um, we can pass for a uh, forty-second year, and it's very, very wonderful, and and this is this is the uh, important success, full and um, I think I think if you want to change uh, this situation, and um, you want to uh, change uh, your uh, life in America, you, uh, I think, uh, I suggest to you, uh, read uh, America, uh, uh, Iran Revolutionary. That's uh, why, why people uh, want to uh, uh, do uh, unique and uh, against to Shah. Shah uh, was very, very powerful and uh, it's very afraid. And and the, and, and why uh, people can uh, broke down uh, Shah and um, can uh, victory in this uh, revolution and uh, by Imam Khomeini and uh, you and uh, other America youngs and uh, Europe youngs or other youngers. Uh, can uh, read uh, this Iran history because it's very important. Because it's very important that 40 second years after this revolution, now it's um, uh, now uh, we are in here and this uh, Islamic revolution and uh, this is successful. And uh, you can uh, read and copy or uh, yeah, uh, learn about it. That uh, change this, and uh, and I hope, and I hope, uh, these days in America uh, will happen very, very soon. Thank you. Definitely, I think you're you're definitely right about we need to know uh, about other places' history, and I think dialogue and and, and knowledge, and not have, being ignorant about other places is key to preventing conflicts. Um, thank you for your words. Um, so the next question was from uh, Justin Simons. Hold on, let me find it. It was for Caleb Moffin. So he said, what are your thoughts and opinions about the possibility of average Americans engaging in the preventing of sales, uh, of arms sales from the United States to violent regimes, uh, such as I assume he's talking about Saudi Arabia, um, with the atrocities they're committing in Yemen and other countries? Well, I think the biggest thing is that there needs to be a new level of awareness. Uh, after General Qasem Soleimani was killed, uh, all over American media, they said uh, that he was uh, just like Osama bin Laden, that he was just like ISIS. And this was a lie. Um, and in fact, General Qasem Soleimani had fought against ISIS, and he had fought against uh, he had fought against, uh, you know, the terrorist forces um, and that 
uh, there was so much deception and that Americans, I think I, I, I used to say after visiting Iran a number of times, I said that everything that Americans think is true about Iran is actually true about Saudi Arabia. Um, because, you know, Iran is a country where they have women who are generals in the military. Uh, you know, women are, are very well represented in the parliament. Um, there are, are Christians who openly practice their faith. Uh, there, are, there are Zoroastrians who openly practice their faith. They have elections. Saudi Arabia is an absolute dictatorship uh, with public beheadings, uh, et cetera. Um, so I think that there's, there's the, the first thing is there needs to be a change in perception. We need to understand that Osama bin Laden and the Wahhabi terrorists and the ISIS terrorists are, are tied to Saudi Arabia. They're not tied to Iran. Uh, but the second thing is that um, the main thing is that economic development uh, is the road to peace. Um, and that's not just true for, for the Middle East region, but for the entire world. Um, you know, when people are in when people are in poverty um, and when people have no other alternatives, like in Afghanistan, if that's when they turn to drugs and that's when they turn to terrorist groups. But Iran and China have long had a plan for bringing economic development to Afghanistan, building railroads so that Afghanistan, uh, because it's a landlocked country, could have access to the ocean um, and they could begin making products that could be sold on the international markets. Um, and what uh, the One Belt, One Road initiative of China is doing um, and what the Eurasian Economic Union of, of Russia is doing and what uh, Iran has tried to do throughout the region is to bring peace through bringing economic development. Um, the United States wants the Arab world, uh, in particular, uh, the Arab countries, uh, to basically function as their, um, their oil source and as uh, purchasers of their weapons. Um, but imagine if countries like Kuwait and, uh, and uh, you know, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia uh, and, and Qatar could be economically prosperous. Imagine if uh, the countries throughout uh, the Middle East region uh, could do what Gaddafi did uh, with the uh, the great man-made river, Gaddafi, he built the world's biggest uh, irrigation system and greened the desert of Libya uh, in a mass construction project. Um, and and in doing so, uh, he made Libya much more economically prosperous and much more stable. Um, and the the goal of the Western imperialists has been to keep uh, the countries in the Middle East region as just underdeveloped countries they can sell weapons to and buy oil from. Um, and the countries that have broken out of that, you know, that system, like Iran, like Libya, like Syria, they've focused instead on economic development. And you should see the amazing highways they have in Iran and the amazing level of economic development that has taken place because Iran has broken free. And, and if the countries in that region could start to become independent and focus on their own economic development, uh, pretty soon they would play a different role. Uh, and they wouldn't be uh, simply, um, you know, playing the role of, of purchasing weapons from the United States. Uh, when Trump went to Saudi Arabia, he talked of building an Arab NATO. Uh, and it would, you know, he basically wants to polarize the Middle East region, um, you know, and polarize the region. Are you for Iran or are you, are you with Saudi Arabia? Um, and he sees a huge amount of profits to be made for weapons manufacturers in doing that. Betsy DeVos, who was Trump's secretary of education, uh, her her brother is Eric Prince of Blackwater. Uh, one of the big Trump supporters is Bernie Marcus, the owner of the Home Depot stores. And, uh, you know, if you go into any of those stores, uh, you can't find a product hardly in a Home Depot. that's not made by a military contracted corporation. So the plan of Trump was to create a new arms race in the Middle East uh, so that lots of money could be made for weapons manufacturers. But the road to peace in that region is economic development. And when countries are trading with each other, they're far less likely to go to war. And if they're trading with each other on a win-win basis uh, and there's infrastructure being constructed and people have opportunities other than, uh, other than drugs or, or terrorism, uh, that's the road to peace. Um, and so my hope is that, that you know, we can push policies of economic development, um, building of infrastructure, um, and, and moving moving these countries away from just, uh, just, just being uh, the oil supplier and weapons purchasers of, of American corporations. Yes, my question is for Zuha. What is the biggest um, falsehood that Americans believe about Iran? The 
suppose Madonna could answer as well at anyone. Uh, could you ask question repeatedly? Yes, sure. What is the biggest lie that Americans believe about Iran? Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest lie, uh, I think, um, there is uh, there are a lot of uh, lying stories about. Iran and Iranian people, but uh, I don't know that uh, you listened what. Uh, I think, um, uh, my belief, and I think that uh, the biggest, the biggest lie is about uh, that uh, we are uh, one to uh, war and uh, kill people. Um, this is this is this is lie and this is and just uh, this is not true uh, because Iran uh, not just for um, belief uh, because our religion our religion is Islamic and um, our religion doesn't allow to us to uh, start war and uh, kill uh, innocent people. Um, Iran always offensive, not offensive, and uh, military strategy. And um, we, um, we defend of a um, country that um, they want to and they need to help. And um, we save uh, all these people, not uh, want to war and kill. And um, maybe uh, some people, or I don't know, or most of people, or some people in the world, um, afraid from Iran. That why Iran is terrorist uh, country. And um, for example, in movies or. Um, propaganda. Uh, this shows that uh, Iran uh, very, very uh, has a um, afraid face, and um, and they want and they want to uh, kill people. And, and this is false, and this is not true. Uh, we are uh, always, we always uh, follow to peace and safe. Uh, people not uh, want to uh, start war, and uh, you you, uh, you can see uh, in uh, Iran historic that uh, Iran uh, never never uh, started any war, but uh, unfortunately uh, your country and um, America um, start a lot of war. And but but um, if uh, if a country want to uh, war and fight to us, um, sure that um, the end of war isn't uh, to uh, finish to uh, to um, to other and to to you. That means um, this country first uh, uh, start. Uh, the, the finish of war isn't uh, um, that um, they want to finish. Um, because uh, we have, and uh, uh, after revolution, after Iran revolution, uh, Islamic revolution, um, we uh, progress to military and scientists and other case. And uh, we have, uh, we have a lot of missiles, and uh, just for uh, defense, not for fights. And um, Imam Khamenei, uh, our super leader, says and uh, said that um, about negotiation. Yeah, we never negotiation, and uh, we don't uh, fight to 
uh, other countries. And uh, because um, our uh, verse about uh, our religion and our ideology, uh, our uh, ideology that um, uh, Shia and Sunni, uh, both of them are Muslim. And uh, in Iran, uh, we live together and um, and other religions and Christians, Jews uh, are in Iran and we uh, we um, live together without any problem. Okay, and but uh, this is important that uh, Iran never, never start any war. And uh, we, uh, we never follow to uh, war and fight and um, that uh, means uh, genocide or something this and um, but but um, if country want to uh, war uh, certainly uh, the answer uh, strongly thank you thank you Thank you so much, Madonna. And I want to give um, every, uh, an applause to everyone here, especially uh, a thank you to David Arovix for that amazing um, tune. Um, again, I am in love with uh, folk music um, once again. And I want to thank uh, Kayla uh, um, <clears throat> for bringing us together as always. And, um, and also um, the fact that, um, that Madonna and uh, Zara um, giving their side of the story and giving their speeches and their word, this should help prove to everyone that the people of Iran are not our enemies. The Democratic People's Republic of, Nor of Korea are not our enemies. Vietnam is, our, is not our enemy. Venezuela is not our enemy. Neither is Russia and neither is China. Our enemy is finance capital, the and the military industrial complex and the Silicon Valley of fascists. Those are our enemies. And we are all comrades here. And I want to give everyone a red salute for tonight. And if you want to follow me, you could follow me at on um, Twitter at uh, Darlene Sharshar. That's C H A R C H A R. And um, follow me, in, and you could also find me on Instagram at just call me Sharsha with uh, the underscore with in between words. And um, also, if um, Lily Gavin and uh, Max Desac, would you um, also uh, tell everyone where they can find you guys as well? Sure. <clears throat> um, you can find me on. A, you can find me on a TikTok at Lily. Da D A Kami Lily Da Kami. <laughs> yeah, go online, search "Students and Youth for a New America," and if you want to reach out to me personally, search Gavin Lockard. That's my name. Um, if you want to keep up with the developments um, that Sign Up Beltway is doing, uh, look, we have a um, on Twitter. We are at Students Beltway with a capital S and a B. And we're also on Instagram as Sign Up Beltway. Um, and if you want to reach out and form a chapter of Sign Up, contact us at uh, sygna.beltway at gmail.com. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, bearing with us for uh, um, um, for almost in, uh, two hours and uh, two and a half hours. Um, I just want to give, um, I just want to say, um, Ugh, excuse me, lost my voice for a sec. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we cannot. We are excited, you know, to uh, see you all again soon. And uh, have a good night. Stay safe and healthy. And solidarity. Thanks for holding. Thanks for holding this yes, and thank you Thank so you. much again, Madonna and Zara. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, thank you very you much. So much. Have a good night, folks. Good night. Thank you.